Hello, everybody, and welcome to our third lecture talking about different ways that you can study public address. Today, we're going to be dealing with how to study texts in their context. And frankly, this is my favorite way uh, to study public discourse. This is my favorite method. And that's because I feel, uh, I mean, this is partially the history nerd in me. Uh, but also because I really feel like this gives us the most information and the most ability to draw things together to be able to deal with our current world, to be able to deal with the things that face us today and the rhetoric we need to create for tomorrow. And so that's one of the reasons why this is my favorite. Uh, so I invite you to join me as we dive a little bit into this one. Um, I would encourage you to have read uh, the speech by Dr. King or watched the video uh, of that speech that's available on YouTube uh, before you watch this lecture. Uh, it'll be helpful as we talk about some of these things. So first, let's talk a little bit about why we would study public discourse through its context. Um, and this is one that I pair with Dr. King's speech on purpose, because he takes those ideas that are in the Declaration of Independence, right? That one day this nation shall rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed, right? Obviously the creed he's referring to is the declaration that all men are created equal. But he does this in such a way that it becomes an absolute touchstone, of the 20th century. He talks about public discourse and he shapes his discourse to be about the immediate moment in which he functions. And so studying public discourse by looking at it through its context, it allows us to watch how successful rhetoric worked in its time and after. Dr. King's speech, for instance, was not actually considered super great in its immediate moment. Lots of people ignored him, called him a rabble-rouser, said he was trying to incite a riot. Yes, a riot. No, Dr. King was not always beloved. Uh, I invite you to look at the record of Strom Thurmond, who remained in the Senate until uh, well into my lifetime. But it allows us to watch what successful rhetoric looked like in the past and understand why a Bretor made the choices that they did. Living in our present moment, it allows us to anticipate problems in our current situations in ways that would impact our lives. Uh, so this can really help us to make better choices and understand and sort of uh, see into the future of what's coming when we deal with rhetoric today. And then as far as our creation and our public address in the future, it suggests solutions to problems in our lives. How did Dr. King deal with, with the, the problems that he faced? How did he inspire us to move forward? It allows us to make better rhetorical choices when faced with challenging contexts. And goodness knows we have enough challenging rhetorical contexts in our lives that if we can learn to do really well the way rhetors in our past have, if we can study the truly great examples in order to emulate them, we might be able to make our future better. And then finally, to use rhetoric to create better worlds when the situation is ripe for it. So being able to have both the knowledge of situation and the knowledge of language in a way that makes us effective rhetors. That's why we study public address by studying it through its context. And those are the reasons that this is my very favorite method of study. So we're going to dive today into what is called the rhetorical situation. And this is a rhetorical theory that was developed originally by Lloyd Bitzer um, in the mid-1970s um, and then quickly modified by Richard Vatz in a way that makes it even more valuable for us today. So we're going to dive a little bit into this theory. Both of these articles, uh, both of these men's published work was also or is also available to you on the course website. So if you need a little bit more depth um, or you want to have a reading to reference, feel free to go and pull those up um, from the uh, supplemental readings on our D2L page. So we are going to start by defining some of our terms here. I'll be throwing these words around, so you might want to keep these definitions handy. The rhetorical situation is the selection of ideas, events, facts, and information in which rhetoric was created. So this is like a particular part of context. 
right? That's the rhetorical situation. Exigence, that's how that word is pronounced. The E is silent. Exigence is an imperfection, as perceived by the rhetor, marked by urgency that could be fixed with rhetoric if the audience follows the rhetor's advice. So this is a problem that is a pressing problem, and if you listen to me, it wouldn't be anymore. That is our exigence. A rhetorical audience are the people who can hear the speaker, hear understood very broadly. Um, so this can be my immediate audience, people listening to me on some form of media, people reading my speeches, anyone who has access and is able to um, take in the information, um, and who are agents of change. That is, people who can act on the rhetor's instructions. And then finally, constraints and resources. And these are anything. Highlight that word. Anything, anything, anything can be a constraint or a resource. Anything in the rhetorical situation that the rhetor or the audience perceives as impacting the rhetoric or that the rhetor can use to move the audience. So that is anything, anything that the rhetor or the audience make relevant. So let's jump into how we actually use these terms a little bit. What specifically is a rhetorical situation? It is a way of studying public discourse by examining the time and place where the rhetoric, where the rhetorical act happened and how the rhetor functioned at that moment. So it's studying both text and context to understand what happened and how and why. The exigence is a serious and compelling need that calls to be answered with public speech. But there's something important about the exigence that we really have to understand here. It's a serious and compelling need. So there's a problem, but it calls to be answered with public speech. This means an event itself is never the exigence. I have shown you a picture of a hurricane headed toward the coast of Florida. A hurricane is not an exigence because a hurricane cannot be fixed with speech. I can talk all I want, and yes, I'm pretty full of hot air, but I'm not going to effectively blow a hurricane away from the coast. The exigence would be, we need to get the people in Miami out of the course of the hurricane, out of the path of the hurricane right? The exigence is something that must be fixable with rhetoric. You cannot stop a hurricane, or perhaps more relevant to today, you cannot stop a virus simply by talking about it. In both the case of those natural disasters, you have to do something to address the people. You have to get the people to wear the masks. You have to get the people to leave Miami. Whatever it is, you have to talk to the people. An exigence has to be something that can be fixed by rhetoric. Next, we have audience, specifically a rhetorical audience. And a rhetorical audience must be made up of agents of change, those who can act on the rhetoric and make the change that the rhetor seeks. This is important. Think about our hurricane example. If you are listening from here in middle Georgia and the uh, hurricane is just going to scrape along the, the coast and really hit Miami, are you able to evacuate Miami? No, of course not. You are not an agent of change. You can't do anything about the hurricane. The discourse is not addressing you. Now, maybe it would be addressing you to call your friends who were going to Miami and encourage them not to go. Maybe it would be calling your family and asking them to evacuate and come stay with you while things are bad. But whatever the case might be, the rhetoric has to address people who can actually make a change. Now, those people can be immediate or distant to the speaker. It can be uh, people who are sitting and listening to the immediate broadcast with the president asking them to evacuate Miami, or it can be the people who are calling their family and relatives who don't watch TV uh, but do answer the phone. And so when you call great Uncle Joe and tell him he needs to evacuate outside of Miami, maybe then he you can be a, 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 a rhetor or a rhetorical audience member an agent of change. A rhetorical audience must have access to what the speaker says, right? So if your uncle doesn't uh, have television and doesn't listen to the news, he can't be an agent of change because he's simply not able to access the rhetoric. 
all the normal factor, factors of demography, identity, space, time, all of those can impact a rhetorical audience. Uh, so let's say demographically, I am the mayor of Miami. I have a lot more power than your Uncle Joe who doesn't watch television to help evacuate people um, from out of the path of the hurricane. And then instrumental action is not necessary. Instrumental action is not necessary. We need something a little bit different than a hurricane uh, to really understand that last part of what a, an audience made up of agents of change means. And so I'm going to direct you back to the speech that we read for today, Dr. King's speech at the March on Washington. And you'll see over on the left side of your screen the picture of the mall um, and all of the people who were gathered for the March on Washington. None of them could... Um, effectively pass le legislation. These were not the senators. These were not, uh, the president was not here. Instead, Dr. King called for a dream. He called for a vision of what the U.S. ought to be. Now, the laws he wanted weren't immediately passed. The sheriffs in rural Mississippi and deep south Georgia who were enforcing racist laws weren't at his speech and weren't listening to him, and they didn't want a new era of brotherhood. Instead, what happened is his speech changed the culture. We began to have a dream of equality as a nation, and that is not instrumental action. It is instead constitutive or cultural creating action. And so that's really important to remember. Instrumental action is not the only thing that we're talking about. We talk about truly exceptional rhetoric. Next, we look at constraints and resources. And this is any content. Highlight that, put a star in it by your notes. Any content to which the rhetor and or the audience have access. Boy, that's kind of everything, isn't it? Yes, Yes, it is. The rhetor's prior ethos, the topic on which the rhetor speaks, the image of the rhetor, the persuasive field, that is all of the other messages that exist in the world, the medium of transmission, the setting of the uh, rhetorical act, all of those are constraints and resources that function in rhetorical situations. I put up here a picture from the march. Uh, these are the speakers. You'll see Dr. King, um, one in from the right on the bottom row. Um, uh, representative, uh, the late Representative John Lewis uh, is also here uh, over on the far left side. Um, these men all had constraints and resources. First of all, they're all men. They're not dealing with any particular gender dynamics, as we'll talk about later this semester. Uh, the persuasive field, a lot of people knew that bad things were happening. America had sort of woken up to uh, some of the most brutal racial discrimination that was going on, and it was not going over well. The topic of equality is very, very different than the top of we want particular topic of we want particular legislation passed. The setting, standing in front of the Lincoln Memorial, is a very different setting than trying to record a YouTube video in your bedroom. All of these things provide constraints and resources that impact the rhetorical situation. Well, geez, that sounds nice and simple and easy and straightforward, right? Well, of course it does, and so I'm going to complicate it for you. Because here's the thing. One year after Lloyd Bitzer published his article outlining the four elements of the rhetorical situation that you could basically just fill in with a checkbox by reading a history book, Richard Vatz came forward and he made life a little bit more complicated. However, he made life more complicated in a way that's really important to these goals that we have of creating better performances and building better worlds. Richard Vatz said that exigence, audience, constraints, and resources are always selections of content from the world. They don't exist out there in the ether. You choose those as a rhetor to build your own moment for speech. That is, rhetorical situations are constructed by rhetors. Context is infinite. Context is everything that has ever been or ever could be related to your speech in the world. 
A rator will always make a selection about to what, what to include and what to exclude. For instance, if we look at Dr. King's speech, he talks only about American situations. We hear lots of uh, different states in his speech. We hear the Declaration of Independence. We do not hear him talk about Maoist China. We do not hear him talk about Gandhi and his fight in India. We don't hear him talk about the history of the world wars or women's rights. We do not hear him talk about uh, theological issues that divide Catholics from Protestant Christians. We don't hear him talk about Islam. We don't hear him talk about anything going on in Bolivia or Brazil or Venezuela or Mexico. All of those things existed and were part of his time and his context, but he, as a rhetor, selected what was most valuable for his rhetorical situation. That means that a rhetorical situation is always a creation and co-creation of meaning between the rhetor and the audience. That is rhetoric. This thing that you and I can create is constitutive. It builds the rhetorical situations. That word constitutive, that's another one to underline. I will use it throughout the semester. Rhetoric constitutes or creates the very situations into which it speaks. Think about that power for a minute. Oh my goodness, your words can create the situation you want to talk to. Your words can create something that allows you to change the world. And then finally, it is a site of contest where multiple rhetors can fight over different meanings. There is not just one meaning to any particular situation. Dr. King is the speaker we remember from the March on Washington. We do not remember Strom Thurmond standing up and filibustering the Civil Rights Movement bill. Right? We remember Dr. King in his choice of what he created in that moment. We don't remember all the people who stood against him. That's what rhetoric can do. It can help you win the meaning of history. Think about that power for a minute. So when we get right down to it, what is a situation? Lloyd Bitzer gives us these four foundations, and then Vats gives us four critiques that make them more meaningful. A situation, Bitzer says, is observable. You can take it from the things out in the world. It is factual. That is, you have to have things that are true as far as they are understood. It calls forth action, and the meaning resides at least partially in the events. That, though, critiques these a little bit. And he says, yes, it's observable, but it is identified and created by a particular person. Yes, it is context yes, it is factual, but it is a selection of facts from a particular context, a selection made by the rhetor. Yes, it calls forth action, but it is contestable action. You have choices as a rhetor of how you're going to deal with particular contexts and meanings and how to create that situation. And yes, the meaning resides in that event, but the meaning is constituted by the rhetor. There is meaning there, but you are the one who get to decide what that meaning is. And therefore, we come down to the idea that a situation is a selection of possible pieces from the context constructed by the rhetor. It is a creation of meaning out of information. It is contestable for different meanings by different rhetors, and it is constituted by rhetoric. This is why this is so important to me, because if we can find and select, construct, create, contest, and constitute rhetorical moments as we see them in history, that means we can have that power to do that today. We're going to end with a bit of a uh, case study. And I'm going to put up this slide and have you take a look at it. Um, and then bring your ideas about the rhetorical situation and how you might construct rhetoric uh, for this case study to class. Uh, so you'll take a look through these different uh, ideas, the different contestable meanings that you might find within this particular context. And then think about how you might select information, how you might constitute a rhetorical situation given some of these facts. Take a few minutes, look through the slide, and make sure you've come with having both prepared for creating the rhetorical situation and having read our assigned readings for today. <laughs>